Hello there. This is Jay Frost speaking to you from, of course, Command Central at the Philanthropy Mastermind Series, brought to you by our friends at DonorSearch. If you don't know who they are, you may not learn much about them today, but that isn't through any lack of affection or respect on our part. If it were not for DonorSearch, then we would not be able to host this series, and we've been doing it since 2016. I counted them today, and this is number 577 in our programs. So if you want to check any of that out, you can do that at DonorSearch.net under the Resources tab. And while you're there, if you want to know more about your donors, and I sure hope you do, you'll find out a lot um, through DonorSearch's services. And I won't tell you any more about that. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But do check it out and do check out all of our past programs as well as those coming up in the future. You're also going to see at the very end of today's discussion, a little survey pop up on your screen when you leave. I would really ask you a big favor, and that is to fill that out. That's the way I'll know what to program for the future so that we can have more people like today's guest, Tom Giddens. And uh, just to give him the briefest of introductions, because that's what he told me I should do. I'll tell you that he has been in, the, in this field uh, a good bit of time, and he has been uh, both guiding organizations through his consultancy today, but also on the staff level leading organizations, including one of the top performing arts centers in the United States, major universities, both here and abroad, for years. So he has a lot to say about a lot in development, but today he's going to be guiding us a little bit through this uh, issue about the, the the top four things that you need to do to, in order to have a very successful planned giving program. In order to have that conversation be a, be uh, one that's interactive, since we can't see you or hear you, I hope what you'll do is utilize the chat as some of our friends are already doing right here. So thank you all for doing that. Um, just go ahead and do as Sandy McNabb has done. It's great to see you, Sandy, and say hello, maybe where you're from in the country, um, maybe which organization you're with, if you're currently working with an organization. If you're from overseas, we'd love to know that too. You can do all that in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A throughout today. So please be a part of this conversation so it can be revolving around what you need to hear today. And so hello from Dallas. Uh, and uh, we, we appreciate that in Stanford, my old stomping ground. Thank you, Lucy and Casey and Patrick and Joseph and Amy and all of you. Uh, that's as much for you as it is for us so that you know who's in the room and you can actually converse with one another. One of the benefits of this, of this series is that I think it's a chance to also introduce one another to one another. And we're going to do that right now by, of course, again, introducing our friend Tom Giddens. Thank you so much, Tom, for, for being here today and sharing with us. I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, 578, I guess, uh, in the uh, the lineup. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's right, and it's it's great to have you. And I I was about to say, where are you today because of your background? But actually, that is kind of a picture of your background. Where are you? I'm uh, at the home of the U.S. Navy in Marblehead, Massachusetts, on the uh, ocean, just north of Boston, about 15 miles. And that's that's your home base as well as your. You know, it is the it base is. of operations for your work. Right. Uh, so I'm sure you can tune into that a little bit. But can you uh, tell us a little bit more about your background? I just kind of alluded to it so you could do us sure. the honor. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, I uh, got into uh, development and have served as a, uh, a development officer at uh, different levels as a major gift officer, as a uh, chief development officer of two institutions of higher education, uh, a major orchestra, and the uh, fifth largest uh, performing arts center in the United States. And as I started my career, I really, uh, my first love was uh, basically plan giving, and it has kind of carried me throughout my career, uh, at times being the focal point of my uh, career and uh, serving as director of uh, plan giving at a major university, and at other times kind of taking a back seat, but always uh, in my purview and interest uh, as a chief development officer uh, and in other positions. So uh, I really entered uh, development, uh, uh, learning about plan giving and enjoying plan giving and continuing to be involved in plan giving, both as a development officer and as a consultant. Uh, uh, I was a consultant for many years with uh, John Brown Limited, which uh, most people will recognize in 
the New England area and beyond, actually. I was a conceit, uh, senior consultant for John for many years. Uh, and then I've done my own business of consulting, uh, not only in plan giving, but uh, in capital campaigns and other activities. But my first and greatest love is plan giving. Why is that? Uh, it seemed to bring together all of the kind of things I was interested in initially and continue to be interested in, and uh, particularly the psychology of giving uh, through a planned gift and the um, ability to leave a legacy and think about one's legacy as opposed to making uh, an outright gift, a current outright gift, uh, although important. It always intrigued me why people made planned gifts. Uh, uh, and so it, it has kind of continued as an interest of mine. And I'm never uh, surprised at the uh, responses I get from donors as to why they're making a planned gift. So it's always interesting. Uh, planned giving is something that some of us have a lot of experience with and some have less. Uh, and when I did prompt people to go ahead and say hello, what I didn't do was ask if they are engaged in planned giving directly. So maybe yeah. one of the things we could ask um, the folks in the room with us to do is to let us know if you're already involved in a planned giving program or in a planned giving role. Um, that might be helpful as we're thinking about this. And so we're hearing from Aaron and Madison and Jessica and Joseph, et cetera, saying, yes, you are. And others who are not uh, or are working on it currently so this is important. And as, as Susan just said, uh, you know, sometimes maybe we get started in this because we receive a bequest. And I don't know if that's something you'll address, that sometimes we stumble into this, like many people talk about stumbling into development. Um, right. but, uh, but there are people all around us who are, have a heart for our cause, and maybe we just haven't talked to them about a planned gift, and they might be making up their will or thinking about their estate plan and have never done it before. So this might be that opportunity. That's that's exactly right. I don't think any of us uh, entered into this world and said to our mothers one day, we want to be a development officer. Uh, and I think the same is kind of true of plan giving. It's kind of the uh, last thing that development people think about. Uh, it's not at the forefront of uh, thinking for a lot of good reasons. You know, the the pressing needs for outright current giving are, are tremendous. Uh, the need for capital campaigns and uh, capital projects are always present. Uh, plan giving tends to have kind of a backseat to all of those annual giving, capital giving uh, campaigns. It's funny though, because we just went through the Giving USA numbers. And this year, like most years, that bequest line is pretty big and yeah. very important. And it, but it, it takes a while to get there, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. It takes uh, a good while but the corollary to those giving usa numbers are there's something happening that people may or may not recognize and that's the uh creation of wealth in this country which is in a linear fashion it is uh uh you know growing and growing and growing and with its growth um the transfer of wealth questions that come up for families and others uh, are tremendous. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, transfer of wealth going on, and it has to go somewhere. And uh, so plan giving uh, plays in a very important part in that transfer of wealth. I, I know that we're going to go through a number of things here to get to your the, the four planks of this conversation. Sure. But you just touched on something really critical with this transfer of wealth. Some of us who have been in the field for a little bit, have heard that phrase a lot. Uh, yeah. be over 20 or 30 years, but others for others, it may be new. I don't know if you're going to talk any more about that, because if not, it might be helpful to just dive into that for a second and just sure. what you're talking about and why it's so important. Yeah, um, I hadn't planned to do it, but I'm happy to do it. Um, right here in Boston, uh, there used to be a center for philanthropy that studied the transfer of wealth. And uh, it, while it no longer exists, its uh, research and its findings uh, do exist, and they point to a, a tripling and a quadrupling of wealth and the need to transfer that wealth uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. And so it's, it's, the wealth has to go somewhere, and uh, 
you know, more and more charities are playing a part of where that transfer is going. So there's a kind of an underlying current, if you will, a, a riptide of, of wealth that has to be addressed by families and others uh, as to where it's going to go and what what's that legacy going to be for an individual and how's that wealth going to be used in the future. Right, right. In fact, we were just having a conversation within the family days ago about uh, when does that estate tax kick in? How much is it really when families have to worry about it? But I suppose all of that is just an opportunity for a conversation. Whether or not people are subject to an estate tax, they do have an opportunity to think about how they want to transfer what they have accumulated over a lifetime, either to family or to charity. It's Yeah. Uh, whether, whether they're, um, you know, subject to estate taxes or not, they're still the uh, major questions that ha have to be answered is what's my legacy going to be? Uh, and who do I want to include in that legacy? Uh, so aside from the, you know, the legal beagles and the estate uh, taxes, uh, families and individuals face the questions, whether that those questions were there or not. So. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I know we're going to jump in here. Um, maybe one last question for the audience, and you don't have to answer it live if you don't want to, but maybe think about it. Um, I know often when we talk about these issues uh, with, with others in fundraising and in philanthropy, we often say, you know, are you also a donor to your organization? Here I might ask, have you made an estate plan or will? Because I find that many people have not done so. And that process sometimes enlightens us as to what the opportunities, but also the the mechanisms are of uh, of uh, doing this work. So if you feel like to, answering it like uh, someone yeah. just did, Clarice, um, thank you for doing that. Um, many of us have not established that, and I'm sure that that'll be a part of the fabric of the conversation as we go on. Um, so I, I, I know you fashioned some questions for us to, to guide this. So I wanna make sure I stay on that script a little bit because it will allow you to really help us understand how to establish and to grow um, a, a program, whether like some of us in the room, it's very new or an idea. And for others, maybe it's an expansion of an existing program, which really needs a, a, perhaps a better infrastructure or might add to it. Um, and the first one, of course, is, uh, you, you know, um, uh, this, this topic of uh, how do we, um, uh, how much income an organization can realize through plan giving? Do you have an idea about that? Sure. Um and let me say that most organizations uh, kind of uh, ask that question of themselves, but often don't have a way to answer it. And uh, there is definitely a way to answer that question. Um, research uh, in plan giving has provided us with a couple of uh, tidbits of information that help us in that equation. One is that 50% uh, of an organization's database would consider making a planned gift if properly asked and encouraged to do so. Uh, the second statistic in research is that one to 5% of that donor database would actually make a planned gift. And the third piece of information is that the bell curve for uh, planned gifts ranges from a low of $35,000 to $73,000. So an awful lot is known about planned giving in those statistics. So that if an organization wanted to get a rough gauge of what its potential gift income was from planned giving, it could simply take um, its donor base number, the number in the donor base, uh, take 1% or 5% of that, and then multiply it by 35% to get the low range or $73,000 to get the high range of what that potential might be. And there's a pretty good uh, idea of what the uh, potential for gift income from playing gifts might be within a given organization. You had a couple of things in there that I wanted to interrogate. I, did you say 50% of a database is possible that might yes. consider a planned gift? Yes, yes. That's 50% of everybody because the, the, often the bias is, well, this is only for people who are over X age. Or right. the, old, the old saw in planned giving years ago was, 
uh, female, uh, what was it? It was flow. I'm trying to remember what that stood for now. It was no. women, women with deceased spouses over 70. It sounded very, it sounds very antiquated now, thankfully. Oh, but, yeah. um, but, but this idea that, oh, only old people, however you define that, um, we're going to be, you, you should talk to about a planned gift. It sounds like you're kind of blowing that, that conception out of the water here. Absolutely. And thanks to Black, Black Bond, we did that. Uh, it's uh, essentially 50% of the donor base would consider uh, making a planned gift. And, uh, you know, those can be pretty striking numbers for some organizations. And uh, if you followed through on the equation and did the multiplication, I think you'd be sometimes surprised at just what is the hidden uh, amount of gold there is uh, among that uh, donor database. Wow. Now, we did have a couple questions already, so maybe we can weave some of these in, Tom, if you don't sure. mind. Um, some may be definitional, and that'll be important. Uh, sure. So uh, first, I'll just ask the last one, which was, how do you define planned giving? And I know you're going to go into that in some detail, but can you give kind of a 30,000-foot definition? Sure. Uh, a planned gift is anything uh, in the form of a, a gift by will, a gift by trust, and there are multiple different kinds of trust that there might be, or as a beneficiary designation of an asset. It's a very simple equation. Uh, I think many times people uh, kind of glaze over the fact that it has to be a charitable uh, nimcrut or, you know, some... <laughs> very <laughs> esoteric kind of thing to qualify as a planned gift. But no, it's very simple. It's a, a bequest by will. It's uh, a, a, a designation in a trust as a charitable uh, beneficiary or a very simple, simple thing of designating a particular asset to uh, a charity. Um, and, you know, it, it can be very simple. Uh, all the way around. And it sounds like, again, to, to dive into that issue about demographics, that someone might be determining how to um, dispose of or, or transfer an asset at many different points in their life. Oh, absolutely. And more and more so uh, younger people who have acquired wealth and uh, have succession questions and legacy questions they have to answer. Um, basically, every Everybody is a plan giving prospect. Uh, you know, you can talk to anybody in your portfolio about making a plan gift, which we'll talk about maybe a little bit later. But uh, from one point of view, everybody is a potential uh, plan giving prospect. But the trick is, as we'll see a little bit later, is to pinpoint those that are the most promising and uh, you can't spend all of your staff time and all of your time, uh, you know, uh, talking to each and every person that might be a prospect. So we're going to try to delimit that a little bit. Although I must say that uh, you could talk to probably any plan giving officer and they could tell you a story about a person who made a major, major plan gift who never gave a dime to their organization. Uh, I personally uh, encountered one individual who ended up making a $3 million gift uh, through a planned gift, never made a dime of contribution to the annual fund or anything else. So it, it isn't outside of the purview to have that kind of planned gift, but it's not really the rule. It's kind of the exception. Oh, and I want to make sure I revisited Jennifer's question earlier, too. You were making a yeah. couple of points in the research. I dove into the first one about the 50 percent, but then right. you touched on this one to five percent. Maybe you could just uh, uh, reiterate. Sure. Uh, the second uh, finding is uh, one to five percent of your donor base will actually uh, end up making a plan gift if, in the strong if, if they're encouraged to do so, and you are uh, working with them to uh, make that gift. Right. And in fact, Sandy uh, McNabb is making a point here about one way to talk about that or promote that. And and uh, so thank you, Sandy. I'm sure we'll jump into that as we get through this a little bit about the stewardship and solicitation phase. But first, um, I know the next question that you were talking about uh, discussing with me is who are the best plan giving prospects? So we've talked kind of 
in this global sense that uh, almost anybody, but who are the best ones is a different question. Yes, it is. Uh, and you don't want to exclude everyone, as we'll talk about. But if you really want to begin to pinpoint the best prospects, uh, who are your best prospects? Uh, they are certainly donors to begin with. And uh, excuse the interruption. Um, the donors uh, generally are. But there are four different ways I usually suggest that you can uh, refine that pinpointing and uh, search for them. Uh, the first way to do that is through what I call profiling. And you alluded to this a minute ago, Jay, when you talked about the, uh, the profile that has been in use in the industry for a long time. But the current profile would be something like this. Uh, the best prospect is a recent, consistent donor, who is a single woman, who is a volunteer or a staff member, and here comes your age, uh, who is 60 years or older. And that's been revised slightly since the profile that you mentioned. But it's a useful profile to use. Uh, you know, it, it's not far off the mark. And uh, uh, they may not be necessarily widowed women, but they could be single women. So there's a kind of an update to that profile. And though using those five or six uh, factors uh, are good factors and keeping that profile in mind will kind of provide you with a way to get to your donor database and identify prospects. The further uh, refinement of that is to expand the factors that are used in that profile and to do a, a direct data analysis of your database and, uh, through uh, uh, a regression equation, basically it's called, uh, to identify uh, prospects. I use a 15 point uh, factor, uh, multi-factor regression equation when I'm working with clients to identify uh, prospects. And these factors uh, can result in a, what I call a uh, plan giving prospect composite score so that you can end up uh, ranking and rating every person in, in your donor database from the highest to the lowest using this uh, uh, data analysis technique and ending up with the plan giving a uh, prospective score uh, and therefore rank order of the uh, prospects that might be in your database. Um, a third way to do the identification is through a donor survey and uh, some of the, the companies like Stelter and Pantera and others have started to use this in recent years. Uh, but it's basically a survey that you can construct on your own that will uh, aim at getting answers to uh, questions that will help you better communicate and to have conversations with plan giving donors. Questions like, why, why do you support our organization? Uh, are obvious, but some of the others that might be part of the survey are, you know, if you're planning to make a gift in the future, uh, which of the following assets might you uh, think about using and an array of assets and the likelihood of their uh, using one or more of those assets is tremendously helpful. And donors are not reluctant to answer these questions. Uh, Another question might be, um, you know, are you thinking about making a planned gift? Uh, would you consider it? Uh, have you already done it? You know, there are ways to get at the question specifically uh, or in, in a more uh, tangential, indirect way. But with, with about four or five questions in a well-constructed sur survey, um, you can identify some very good plan giving prospects and not only identify them, but have the talking points to talk to them about a plan gift. Um, 
the fourth and final reason that I usually suggest, and it's a, a little different than any of the first three, and it's a very simple process. Um, if an organization has an online uh, landing page where online gifts can make, and that um, function contains the ability to add questions before the checkout, uh, you can ask three questions that are simply a checkbox uh, before that checkout. And the first question would be, you know, I would like to learn more about making a planned gift. And secondly, it might be, I have making a planned gift on my to-do list. Uh, the third one is, I have already made a, a planned gift to your organization. And putting those three checkboxes and making certain people understand that they're optional questions, you get an awful lot of good responses that you uh, wouldn't get otherwise. So everybody making a gift, an outright gift, sees those questions and responds to those questions usually uh, before checkout. Uh, I love all of those. Um, Tom, do you have any more before we move on? Because I have a couple uh, questions about no, some of those. the four primary, although there's one kind of buried in the cultivation oh. plan uh, later on that we'll talk about that might okay. show its head in our discussion. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, I, I just I, just to review those. So you're talking about the profile and the profile has been updated a bit. Sounds like the ages come down, even though our longevity has increased. So that's very interesting. But I wanted to ask you on the profiling bit, if you could talk about why, uh, why women, why people 65 and older, why single, uh, widowed or not? Why are these sure. things indicative? Well, let's start with women. Uh, study after study shows that women are more generous than men, uh, plain and simple, you know? Uh, and so it's not surprising that it's women that show up in the profile. Mm -hmm. uh, single has a, a lot of different connotations. And what it means is you have no dependents. And generally, if you have no dependents, you have no uh, legacy concerns for them that you might have otherwise. Uh, and the age has come down for the very reason that we talked about before more and more people are becoming more wealthy earlier in life than they have in the past. So age is a factor and it's coming down. Well, let's hope that continues to be the case for, for <laughs> many of us here in the room. Um, right. The next one, I'm sure that there are people like me who are math challenged, who were, when you start talking about regression analysis, thought, oh no, do I need to get out a calculator or a chalkboard? No. So no. Um, can you talk about uh, the regression piece. I mean, I don't know how much of that secret sauce you can reveal in a webinar, but what, why is that important at least? And how can people try to approach that kind of a, uh, you know, the, the, that, that methodology? Yeah. Well, the regression analysis just is just the statistical explanation of what goes on. But basically, uh, it's taking any number of factors that might uh, have importance in determining or predicting uh, someone who might be a, a good prospect. And, uh, you know, if you had one single factor to use out of all of the ones that you might pick, the frequency of giving would be the one factor that you could use and not have a, a regression equation. But by using a regression equation, which means you're adding factors with different weights to them, you can increase the pre uh, uh, prediction of and the outcome of the prospect. So it's uh, just uh, aligning a lot of different uh, factors and then weighting them and adding them together to get a composite score that then has some meaning. And uh, I know if anybody's ever done the social uh, uh, screening, uh, well screening, uh, it's the same kind of process that goes on. Only in plan giving, um, the weighting it tends to be or should be uh, slightly different than thinking about a major gift prospect, basically. Yes, this is this is important. In fact, someone had asked earlier about uh, specific products, including our sponsor here. But we generally, at least I generally, don't 
touch on specific companies uh, right. uh, unless unless our guests like you do. But um, but it, but that's true that the, the uh, there are a number of companies that build these models either into their software or companies where you can go and have these things done. But as you just said, having it be specific to your needs and specifically planned giving um, right. is is different from let's say something that looks at sustaining giving or or. Yeah. Um, event uh, promotion or major gifts, those are all kind of different animals in a way. Yeah, just, just to pick out one uh, factor that might be an equation. Uh, a lot of organizations don't keep this data, but for those that do, knowing uh, the frequency and attendance at uh, various events that an organization has is a very critical factor to understanding their relationship to the organization, which normally is not in those well screening uh, kinds of things that are done. Uh, you know, there, there are various factors that uh, aren't part of that screening that should be part of the screening for planned giving because they, uh, they determine the relationship of the person beyond just the, the giving pattern of the individual to the organization, so. Right. Well, hopefully Example, we'll find uh, AI is doing more of that for us in a way. I mean, yes, I was just going to say AI is beginning to do that more and more. And for example, if, if you're if you have the capability with your in, within your database to keep track of all of the um, digital interaction with people, you're able to tell that they're opening emails, watching videos, doing things that right. you know, are terribly important indicators to know what their strength of their relationship is to your uh, organization. And those factor into more than anything else in plan giving. And, uh, you know, the grateful patient, the grateful alumni, the grateful uh, this client or that, and their relationship to you, uh, your organization is really key to the that uh, analysis using uh, data analysis. And I, I don't want to give short shrift to the other pieces. You did talk sure. about surveys, and we did have uh, Vicky who talked about how powerful and useful they've been to her. And and certainly I've seen it as well as the point of purchase kind of approach you talked about, which is right. really, we've had folks from Next After talked about that in the past, um, really brilliant examples. Uh, maybe this is a good point uh, to, to remind folks that we are recording this. So if you have someone in your office who needs to hear some of this along with you, but they're not present, uh, a recording of this will be sent, um, or, or linked to it rather, will be sent in an email you received afterwards so you can share this with them. And that discussion about surveys, I'm sure will be very material to what you do in your offices. Um, and additionally, uh, Tom, if you don't mind, I'll just ask you right now if you could share how people might learn more about you and get in contact with you. We're going to keep talking, but in case sure. has to sure. leave early, that way they can learn more about, for example, yeah. the uh, Let me just underscore what Vicki uh, Drummond uh, brought said and her little uh post in chat is right on the money that's right. exactly what happens when you use a survey um i'm happy to answer questions as we go as we're doing or at the end or if there's something that we don't get answered in the session today i certainly am uh, happy to respond to any emails that you might want to send to me and my email address is T Giddens, G I D D E N S, 1011 at gmail.com. And I'm happy to respond to any emails you want to send and questions that you want to send uh, that might occur to you that didn't get answered in the session or occur to you after the session. Additionally, if there's more detail that you want to discuss about any of the items that we're discussing today, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to set up an individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, free online Zoom meeting to answer whatever your interest is. Thank you for that, Tom. And by the way, Abby, we did just, or rather Jack, just put that in the chat so you can see a link to both um, uh, Tom's LinkedIn, uh, but also, of course, to his yeah. email. Um, now, I know the next big piece here is really about what happens next. So we, we know now that what the economic opportunity is. Uh, we we know maybe where to look for the people who are our best prospects, um, but then what to do about cultivating them. Can you talk about, sure. about that? 
Yeah, well, I think the basic thing is to develop a, a communication plan uh, that includes um, communications that are exclusively focused on plan giving. And it seems simple to say, but uh, you know, a lot of people don't do it. And not only would I suggest developing a communication plan, uh, but to space that plan in certain months to avoid uh, the usual annual fund times of the year when solicitations for uh, annual funds are made. And so I usually suggest uh, uh, communications in January, April, July, and October so that you avoid that uh, crush with uh, what might be uh, solicitations for annual fund. Organizations differ as to the times of the year that they do that, but almost universally, uh, most organizations do a November and December year end push. And you wanna stay in my judgment, uh, clear of those kinds of pushes and coordinate uh, the communication about plan giving around other times or around other special campaigns and make it a separate kind of thing. As to the content for those uh, communications, um, I really have a couple of suggestions. If in fact um, you have someone who's made a, uh, an estate gift or several people, one of the best ways to uh, promote uh, plan giving is to profile those people and particularly to uh, make certain you understand and communicate why they made the gift. And uh, often those profiles are very influential in others pe other people's thinking about it, particularly if they're well known within your uh, community and uh, have some visibility. Uh, those profiles can also be consolidated into a hard copy publication uh, I usually publish them under the title Profiles and Commitment, and they are simply a collection of profiles that have been run through the communication system through a given year, but uh, uh, it's kind of a booklet of, of uh, profiles. The other thing is to um, be sure that you keep things simple and talk about what we talked about earlier, that uh, plan giving is really just making a, a gift by a will, a trust, or a beneficiary designation, and maybe illustrating some of those uh, vehicles, but not all of them at once so that people's eyes don't glaze over. <laughs> uh, the other thing is to promote within those communications your partnerships with other local community members who share your interest in plan giving. And I'm thinking particularly of um, local law firms who might be undertaking virtual or on-site or hybrid seminars on estate planning and other things. Uh, usually every community has one or two law firms that will do that and you can piggyback on doing that and helping them promote attendance at those events. And if you're promoting it through an email, email you may be able to see actually who's going to those uh, events by uh, looking at the analytics for the particular email and see who's clicking through to those events and getting some idea of where they stand in terms of thinking about plan giving. There also are non-local sources at the national level, uh, which I'm sure if you Google, you know, estate planning seminars, webinars, you can get a, a host of them. But the one that I recommend at the top of my list is a set of uh, webinars and videos that were done by Russell James at the test of the Texas Tech University. He is the top of the line. He is the best you can find. He is simple. He's not complicated, and uh, he's a great resource uh, to refer people on to uh, virtually. And uh, so that that would be the uh, contact uh, and content that I would recommend. We've uh, had Ron Russell James in this series too, so if we can, we will put. Oh, a is that right? Is he part of the series? Oh, yes, right. yes. So um, 
Yeah, he's he's a wonderful guy. He's been very generous with his time and and yeah. Uh, oh yeah, great. Is he much of he's coming up? Hmm? Oh, Is not he... not no no. But we should have him back. Uh, we haven't had. Oh, him recently. Been, okay, great. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he is wonderful. And that's Russell James, Jennifer. Russell James. Um, so yeah. we'll we'll make sure that we at least find some link to him or something if Jack can find that. It's Dr. Russell James. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to ask you one question on this cultivation front that has come up sometimes for me, which is that uh, people talk about, about some of the simple communications we all do, including our websites. And right. I'm just wondering if you have a thought on whether or not profiling of people who are making these commitments is also helpful as a part of the cultivation, rather than just talking about the people we provide services to, which is also right. very important, but also <laughs> focusing on the people who make those services possible. Is there a, still an advantage to that? Yes, well, that's why I mentioned it. And I think as part of the communication plan, profiling those people is very, very helpful. And I mentioned turning those communications into a hard copy booklet, the uh, profiles of commitment. And what you can do is take that booklet and you can put it in every uh, office lobby center that you have, wherever you can reach. And uh, it's a great vehicle for people to see people in their own community and who they're supporting and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you for that. So yeah. that's a cultivation, I guess. And, and cultivation uh, one, can be one quite final, wrong. One final oh, thing, Dave, just yeah. a quick suggestion. Um, I think, think using a tagline wherever you can uh, would be a good thing as part of the communication uh, plan. And the tagline that I have in mind is a very simple one. It says, please remember X, and X would be the name of the organization, uh, in your estate plans. That little tagline can be used uh, on every email signature line, on every letterhead, on every social media post. It can be used anywhere and everywhere you can think it might reach somebody. And it's just a very simple little reminder that people ought to be thinking about their estate planning and remembering you in their estate plans. Is there any reason why someone, why an organization would not want to do that? I can't think of any, but uh, <laughs> there may be, maybe somebody in the chat could tell us why that shouldn't be done. <laughs> um, well, it, it, so uh, then, then of course, uh, there's the issue of solicitation and, yeah. and final stewardship uh, to make sure we don't forget the people who are making these commitments who end up in those binders and on those websites. So can you talk a little bit about this solicitation process? And in fact, I think we have a, even a question that came in earlier about, um, uh, what to do next. So uh, perhaps uh, that, that's a, a good jumping off point. Yeah. Well, cultivation ought to be going on continuously. And if you're doing what we've been talking about as a regular basis, uh, four times a year and cultivating everybody, whether they're already a donor or not, a plan given donor or not, uh, makes sense. But in terms of the actual solicitation of uh, a donor, my suggestion would be to take the research that you've done in the first step. Mm -hmm. And if you have a uh, rank order of prospects that you've developed, just start at the top of that list and develop for e each individual in the list, starting at the top down, a um, uh, moves management plan. And that moves management plan should answer uh, several questions. One would be, who is the best person to ask the prospect for this planned gift? Um, what is the right kind of gift to ask of this person who is a prospect? Is it an unrestricted gift? Is it a restricted gift? Is it an endowment gift? Is it a non-endowment gift? Uh, and have some targeted kind of gift to be asked of the individual. Uh, it may be an outright gift that you ultimately decide is appropriate, but uh, maybe you want to do a blended ask where you ask both for the outright gift and uh, a plan gift to endow that gift uh, basically later on. Um, so who's the right person? Who's What's the right kind of gift? Uh, what's the right level of giving you should be asking for? And in terms of plan giving, I would suggest that uh, the, the magic formula might be four or five times the largest gift amount the person has ever made. 
I don't, I, as a minimum, uh, I think that uh, there would be very, very few people in your database who couldn't meet that standard in terms of making a plan gift. So I'd view it as a minimal four or five times their, <clears throat> their largest gift. If you were wanting to fully uh, endow their largest gift, the, the magic number would be 50 times that largest gift and you could secure an endowment that would perpetuate their giving. And that's an awfully good kind of conversation to have with the donor about perpetuating their gift and support beyond the point when they're no longer able to do that. Uh, and so 50 times whatever the largest gift is, is a pretty good starting point. Um, and then uh, when is the right time to ask them? And the right time will vary from person to person. Some people have a, a standard uh, time of the year when they like to make gifts. It might be at Thanksgiving, it might be at year end. Uh, but to try to pinpoint when is the best time to ask them. There may be other uh, factors that uh, are at play in uh, determining that uh, particular time, such as other asks that might be underway and things like that. But if if you can construct for each individual basically a moves management plan and a solicitation plan, I think uh, you'll probably proceed pretty quickly and easily with those conversations. Uh, Tom, on the moves management piece, I, I know that some people, again, in the room will have a lot of experience with that, others will not, and perhaps some of the definitions of those pieces have changed. You just talked about, I guess, what Jerry Panis used to describe as the natural partner in that process, too. So here's, a, or, here's that person. And, um, but I wonder if, if any of that has changed with time, or if that, that approach still is, is the, is, uh, is the way that helps us and the donors best. And if there are any tools that can enable us, you know, help us to, uh, sure. to systematize that process. Sure. Well, you touched on one of my heroes in plan giving, Gerald Panos. And uh, you're exactly right. If you followed his kinds of prescriptions and what you suggested, I think it's, it's as timely today as it was when he first articulated it. So yes, I would say, follow that plan and, and you'll make success, basically. He had the formula right. Um, I, and I know that when it comes to software, that maybe that can help to uh, put these things in there and make sure you follow them. <laughs> so if one of us leaves or- Oh or yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you know, there are tracking systems that you can keep track of that and everybody doesn't have to remember it, basically. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so that's on the solicitation front, and um, and I, uh, I guess it stands to reason that this is much like major gifts, and that ultimately we should be sitting down with people physically. Is that right? Uh, or virtual? You know, today people are not adverse to virtual uh, conversations, uh, but yes, either in person or uh, virtually, and sitting down with them one on one is exactly the key. Um, it, you talked before about uh, the best prospects and and especially about, uh, you know, single women in this case because of their generosity, but also their longevity and lots of other reasons. But I'm wondering when people are married and you have these conversations because there are clearly going to be married people in, in that prospect pool. Um, it, it, are you how are you navigating that conversation? <laughs> because it's not always easy to get those two people in the same space at the same time and to talk about these issues that, of course, uh, uh, impact both of them. Yeah. Well, the ideal is to have both of them have a conversation. And if you're having a single conversation, perhaps uh, make the suggestion that you'd like to sit down with both parties at some point when it seems appropriate to talk further about it. I, I one one last question on this front. I know that um, that that Jerry Panis, um, but also some of the other people that that I knew from there in the past would have asked about objections. So when you encounter objections, when it comes to planned giving, I don't know how different they might be from major gifts, which is more familiar to me. Can you talk right. about how you've uh, addressed people's objections? 
Well, I think it depends on the objection. You know, uh, a lot of people are just adverse about talking about uh, dying and leaving a legacy. I think that's probably the biggest uh, objection. <laughs> and so it, it's to have conversations that aren't about death and dying. Uh, it's to have a, a discussion about leaving a legacy and how that can be accomplished and what impact that will have on the lives of people in the future. And probably more and more, that's the tone and tenor of the conversations rather than, you know, death and dying and estate planning. Uh, it's, it's what's your legacy going to be and how do we talk about that? What do we do about that? Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, um, and then, of course, that leads us to making sure we do not forget these people who have a commitment to the mission, and that's stewardship. And it also seems to be the thing that at least in the rest of development often gets, I don't know, put in the closet with everything else. But can you give us a, some guidelines as to how stewardship plays a role here and some of the things that we should be doing to ensure that we're really keeping sure. in contact with these folks? Well, I'd start off by saying plan giving donors are no different than outright donors. Uh, they should be thanked multiple times uh, for their giving. And our good friend, Gerald Panos, uh, was the first to observe that you haven't really uh, uh, thanked a donor until you've thanked them six times during the course of a calendar year. Uh, that's page 49 on his very first book called Mega Gifts. And he really set the standard for the industry in thanking donors, primarily outright donors, but it still applies to planned giving donors. And so if you've developed a thank you program for donors that follows that advice and occurs at multiple times during the year, it might be six times, it might be something less than that, but it's certainly more than just the initial uh, thank you uh, for their gift um, and follow Panos's advice. Uh, you can weave into that already ex uh, established pattern and timing uh, a thank you for uh, a plan giving donor who is also an outright donor and just make it a combined thank you rather than a single thank you. Or if they're not an outright donor, uh, to simply thank them for their plan giving. So my first suggestion would be to have a robust uh, following Panos's suggestion, multi-time multi, multi -time, uh, thank you uh, for donors. Uh, the second thing I'd recommend is the creation of a recognition society so that those who have made gifts, planned gifts, are recognized separately from annual donors or lifetime donors. Whenever, uh, you know, honor rolls of donors or other kinds of recognition are made, they're, they're a standalone group. And a, a person might be a member of all three groups. Uh, annual giving, plan giving, and lifetime giving recognition. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. But do think about a recognition society creating it either after somebody who's made a plan gift, if you have somebody, or some important historical event in the life of the organization. Uh, you know, there are any number of kinds of names that you can give to a plan giving recognition society. Um, then I would devise uh, certain benefits of being a member of that society, such as an annual event to recognize uh, plan giving donors uh, who are members of the society. It might take place with another recognition event, or it might be a standalone event, but certainly have, have an event, whether it's uh, on site or virtual. And for organizations that have a spread of uh, donors across the country, uh, you know, it could be a hybrid event where it's both virtual and on site. Uh, that's become very, very popular. Um, and then uh, I, I think you could survey plan giving donors, just like we suggested earlier to donors in general, but to focus more on how is the organization delivering on its mission? How is it doing in terms of programs? Uh, more program oriented than what was suggested previously, but surveying them certainly is part of the stewardship uh, process. That would also seem to address uh, one of the concerns and maybe it's rare, but it gets a lot of uh, attention 
um, when donors uh, or donors' families challenge a gift later yeah. or yeah. the way it's recognized or changing recognition if if we are in touch with people and really sensitive to them and listening to them and surveying them, hopefully right. we're undercutting some of those negative impulses. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, before we wrap up, I want to remind everybody, first of all, that you're going to be receiving an email with a link to this. So if you don't see that email from us, look in your spam folder, uh, or you can always reach out to me. It's uh, My name is uh, Jay Frost, of course, but it's jay at donorsearch.net is my email address here. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, I hope you'll join us for a couple of sessions we have coming up, which is um, there's, uh, this Thursday, of course, we have Aaron Straza, who's going to be talking with us about giving donors something to care about, which dovetails with everything we're talking about right now um, with the stewardship um, of donors. Um, and it's uh, how to grow a passionate donor base. So it's not specifically about planned giving, but what I hope we will all be doing. That's on Thursday at 3.30. And then we also have an episode of the podcast dropping, which you can listen to wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And that's with uh, Anthony Cernera. He's going to be talking about what life is like for a person who's not only been in development for a long time, but is one of maybe 120 people in the world who is a multiple uh, living organ donor as well as having jumped out of a plane 2,000 times. So if you want to hear about that, um, check out our podcast. Um, but let me let me go back here. And Tom, you, you've given us a lot to work on and to chew on, and we've had great interaction with people in the audience. I love that. Thank you all for that. Please, again, fill out our survey uh, as you leave today, whenever that is. But I do want to ask you, as we kind of sum up, is there anything that you have found particularly challenging, especially now as we have headed kind of out of the pandemic, um, often forgetting that it ever happened. Uh, and 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 we encounter these issues attendant with planned giving within our organizations. Is there anything that you are particularly sensitive to and guiding people on to make sure that we do the right thing as we come out of a time of great mortality and we want to help people really confirm their legacy? Yeah, I think so. I think we've all become, because of COVID and, and what has transpired with uh, virtual meetings and everything else, uh, kind of a little insensitive to the the human touch. And uh, I think revisiting ways to reach out to people and interact with them the way we did before COVID is uh, certainly what's needed on the horizon. So uh, I, I would work on that a lot. Thank you. Um, we did have multiple people ask about that book, Omega Gifts. That's oh yeah. Jerry Panis. Um, make sure to also include that if Jack can find that he can put it in the uh, in the chat. And um, so take a look there before we close out today. Once again, uh, also in the chat, you'll find a way to reach out to Tom. That was a very kind offer to be able to talk to you about what you're trying to accomplish in planned giving. And another shout out to all of you to hopefully uh, do uh, what's beneficial to you and think about where this all fits with your own legacy. Um, we, I know we're all professionals in this field, but we're also humans first and our causes matter to us. And maybe this is a way for us to, to uh, put that into practice as well. Thank you so much, Tom, for everything today. Really do appreciate it. Uh, it's been delightful to be with you and the others. And uh, thanks again. Hope to see you all soon. Until then, take care.